Hello everybody, hope you're having a great day and doing well. Sit back and relax as in this video, I'll be breaking down Kaneki's participation within the raid of the 20th Ward. I remember when this arc was going on as I was graduating middle school and I genuinely could not believe that this series ended with Kaneki quote unquote dying. I had never read any story where the protagonist fails or anything like that. So the amount of cope I was doing was crazy. From coma theories to Ishida someday announcing that he has 10 more chapters for Tokyo Ghoul, it's honestly a funny time for me to look back on as an adult. Kaneki stands over Tokyo, understanding the weight of the burden he's about to undertake the moment that he enters himself into the 20th ward. As Kaneki readies himself, Nishio enters and says to him, So you're going. Are you that stupid? The two then sit down and talk, with Nishio telling Kaneki that, Yomo had contacted him, and that the CCG is shutting down an entire ward and raining Anteku just for serving coffee. It's really ridiculous. Guess this is how things suddenly end. The only life that seemed normal crumbles in an instant. When it ends, it's always abrupt. Nishio points out to Kaneki that with all the ghouls they're going to kill just for the sake of getting the ghouls at the cafe, they'll never know which servers at Anteku were actually ghouls. He then recalls what Yoshimura told him. If you pick up and disappear, they won't try to find you. Nishio expresses his empathy and gratitude for Yoshimura, the only way he knows how, by saying that he hates him for always trying to save their asses. Kaneki looks at Nishio and says, if I hadn't taken you to the cafe, but Nishio cuts Kaneki off and tells him not to feel bad about it, as saying something like that won't do anything but piss him off right now. And if you notice, Nishio tends to express his gratitude through saying things like this. Nishio continues to ask Kaneki, if it's truly necessary for him to do what he is going to do, and why doesn't he decide to continue living for those who are waiting for him at home? Why does he march on into this raid, despite Yoshimura and his seniors sacrificing themselves for his well-being? Kaneki then answers Nishio, saying, I keep thinking, why Mr. Yoshimura? For who? For what Mr. Yoshimura opened the cafe for? Why would somebody who loves people so much? Did you know? There's a cup stored in the back of the cupboard, a small antique, a coffee cup. I've never seen it be used, not even once. I think he's been waiting for a long time, all of this time. Kaneki's purpose in participating in this raid is revealed through this passage. As Kaneki would empathize with many parts of Yoshimura, the unconditional kindness Yoshimura displays to all who comes across him despite the immense power he holds. The father-like figure that he plays to Kaneki and all who comes into the cafe, and mostly, Yoshimura's longing for a parent-child relationship to come to fruition. The same loneliness and longing that Kaneki sees in Yoshimura is one that he understands himself, and thus, he wants Yoshimura to live on to also satisfy that pain he knows so well. As Kaneki has said that he will work with everybody and stop working alone, he tells Nishio that this is the last time that he will take on anything alone. As saving Yoshimura is more than just saving somebody to him, but a rite of passage. Tsukiyama then enters and interrupts Kaneki, stating that he will not allow Kaneki to enter this raid. As Tsukiyama is aware that Kaneki has no chance of surviving the raid, he begins to ask him what is the point of anything if he just runs into certain death. Kaneki says that he understands the risk, and since Tsukiyama doesn't know how to express himself, he charges at Kaneki, telling him that if he will not listen and refrain from entering the Anteku raid, he will kill him here. Tsukiyama really tries to convince Kaneki that it's useless in trying to do anything about this, and that even with his family and connections, he will not be able to help Kaneki here. He declares that he will not allow anybody to get in his way of eating Kaneki. Some time passes of these two's confrontation, and we see that Tsukiyama is exhausted and bawling his eyes out, begging Kaneki to please not go. Tsukiyama drops the act and asks Kaneki as a friend, genuinely caring for his life, to not march into certain death. Kaneki apologizes to Tsukiyama and thanks him for trying to stop him. He grabs his mask and firms his resolve to save his friends. These people who are attempting to sacrifice themselves for his and others' sake deserve to be saved, and as he refuses to allow anything to be stolen from him again, Kaneki declares that he is tired of being helpless. Tokyo Ghoul enters its final act. Kaneki saves both Koma and Irami from the special investigators and creates a new plan with Irami 
to reunite at Route V-14, once Kaneki is able to save and assist Yoshimura. Kaneki moves towards saving Yoshimura, and eventually is halted by Amon, someone that he does not want to hurt by any means, let alone fight. He tells Amon that he will not fight him, and attempts to run away. To which Amon responds by telling Kaneki that there is absolutely no chance of him allowing Kaneki to escape. As Amon prevents Kaneki from running away, he says that Kaneki always seems to show up at critical moments of his life, asking if Kaneki is the manifestation of the Grim Reaper. Amon then prepares himself to battle, and Kaneki does the same, pointing out that there is no point in even attempting to run away here, as Amon will just chase him down even if he does. Kaneki then obliges to the battle, but since he does not want to kill Amon, he asks for his name. Amon responds to Kaneki by playing the role of an investigator, but deep down inside, he values Kaneki as a person as much as Kaneki values him, even thinking to himself that if Kaneki gets past him here, the other investigators will just try and kill him themselves. Amon then yells his name to Kaneki. Meanwhile, deep down inside of himself, he says that this is an unreasonable request of him to ask of Kaneki, but please survive this battle and raid, some way, somehow. Kaneki and Amon's reasons for fighting in this hopeless situation at the moment oppose one another. As Kaneki's in this raid due to his reckless and uncontrollable emotions, whereas Amon is in this raid due to his absolute drive to follow his duty through no matter what. With both Kaneki and Amon being possessed by such forms of thinking, they weren't in their best mental states, and were honestly trying to do everything they can to make the best out of the situation. Kaneki had almost no logic in him during this arc and Amon did not consider his empathy once when choosing his actions. Time and time again they have spared one another, because they knew that one prospering was better for the other. And yet, when these two have both of what they value on the line, all sense of rational thinking goes out the window, and for the first time in the series, they choose to not communicate with one another and find some sort of middle ground or compromise, which leads to tragedy for the both of them. This relationship between Kaneki and Amon resembles both ghoul and human societies, and how both could prosper when they're in the correct and balanced states, willing to work together to find an answer. However, these two decided to fight due to circumstance instead of taking any time to talk things out. And when you see things from both of their perspectives, you can't blame either one of them. As Kaneki and Amon fight, Amon is very easily able to point out that Kaneki is trying to disarm him rather than actually hurt him, but Amon says he cannot let him get to the owl no matter what. However, Determination is not enough to overcome the eye patch. Kaneki disarms Amon, and Amon lays on the ground to feed him, pointing out that this ended the same as the last time they fought, and as he almost passes out, a doctor from the CCG comes flying in a car, and throws two suitcases towards Amon to assist him. Two new Quinque are given to him at this moment, and as he states that he can continue the fight, Amon activates both the auto-equipping Arata 2 and the Dojima Spear. In response to this, Kaneki now assesses the situation, creating a plan to handle both the lance and the armor, as he has experience with both, but a plan is not enough. Amon takes one step with the armor and shatters the ground beneath him, instantaneously appearing in front of Kaneki and sending him flying across the streets of Tokyo with one strike. As Kaneki lands on his neck, he's surely taking tons of damage, enough pain to forcefully activate his Kakuja state, the centipede. Kaneki and Amon begin to fight once more, and we enter Amon's perspective. With him saying, I've lost so much in my life, my biological parents, the illusion of a foster parent, friends, my mentor, I'm afraid. What will I lose next? This is the last bastion. I can't let him pass. Eye patch. How about you take a break too? With this, the two clash. And the winner of this clash is... Kaneki Ken. We see through Amon's monologue that he's driven by the same thing that Kaneki's driven by, both the love for the people in his life and his unwillingness to lose them. These two things played a huge role in pushing Kaneki and Amon to put their lives at such high risk by entering this raid and fighting one another. Uncontrollable emotion and unwavering duty. What both had in common was the desire to protect people who loved them and gave them a reason to live. Even after they were both abandoned by the world itself as children, this mutual desire leads to both Kaneki and Amon taking their respective mindsets to the extreme and results in them being way too weakened to protect anybody else for any longer. 
Amun passes out due to the immense damage he's taken from losing the clash, and thinks back to his parents, and then sees Donato, his original foster parent who was a ghoul himself. He says, damn, damn it, even at a moment like this, why? Why is it you? I'd get into this, but Amon and Donato deserve their own video. We now see the aftermath of Kaneki's fight with Amon, where he comes to consciousness out of his centipede state and realizes that Amon was able to leave a gaping hole in his torso. Upon the shock of this pain hitting him, Kaneki falls to his knees. And furthermore, the damage was so heavy from the blow that Kaneki can no longer regenerate his wounds. Kaneki now begins to desperately crawl throughout the streets of Tokyo, telling himself that he has to get up and make it to Yoshimura in order to save him, screaming repeatedly that he must. Kaneki continues to drag himself through the heavy rain and tells himself that he can't be out in the open in this condition. He needs to go underground and heal, then come back up and return to the battlefield. Kaneki heads into the sewers and begins to break down mentally due to the immense pain from his fight with Amon, his hunger as a ghoul, and the stress of saving Yoshimura and potentially killing Amon. He mindlessly scurries through the water, telling himself that he needs to go and help. Kaneki's ghoul side begins to take over his mind as he deteriorates underground in pure isolation, telling himself that he must find somebody and kill them in order to eat them, but then he tells himself that he doesn't want to do that. Then he proclaims that he'll protect everybody and nip evil in the bud, things he told himself long ago. As his breakdown continues, he then sees faces in the water. It's Rize and Jason. Both of them grab onto him, and Kaneki screams for them to stop and let go. He tells them to give it back to him. Stay away from him. Go away. My body is mine. Please get out of my body. Kaneki is losing his mind here due to many factors, and as he rips his mask, he screams once more, and he finally acknowledges that he's beginning to lose his mind, and that when he consumed Rize in order to defeat Jason and control his anger and aggression in order to absolutely crush anything that stood in his way or threatened the lives of those that he loved, he never truly controlled that side of himself. But the other way around, Kaneki's emotions had ended up controlling him and led him all the way up to here, this downward spiral within the depths of the earth where none can hear his screams or cries. Kaneki's in isolation once more, yet he fought so hard to escape this. But has Kaneki ever found himself in true isolation? Hey Kaneki. As Kaneki hears that voice, we see who it is. The person who's always been there for him no matter what. Even after Kaneki lost his family and was abandoned by the next one, Hide was always there, and he's still here today. He asks Kaneki, What's with that outfit, attempting to lighten up the mood? And then Kaneki turns around. We see that he's completely transformed into a cockage state, representing his mental instability. Hide asks if Kaneki's been struggling all this time, and tells him that he doesn't need the mask anymore. Kaneki doesn't believe that Hide would be there, and thus attempts to convince himself that what he's seeing was an illusion. Hide puts his hand on Kaneki's shoulder and says that he's aware of Kaneki being a ghoul all along and that he wants to help him escape, but there's no chance of Kaneki making it out. So he asks, can Kaneki fight with all he's got just one last time? That's the only way. Hide was gone, and I was all alone. My wounds were all healed, and I could taste sweet blood in my mouth. I kept walking aimlessly, as if to hide the smoldering apprehension in me. When I reached the clearing, I could smell overmatured and decaying flowers. Somebody was standing in the middle of the flower bed. Nobody had to tell me. He didn't have to make himself known either. Like a puzzle piecing itself together on its own, I knew by sight who he was. CCG's Reaper, the undefeated ghoul investigator, Kisho Arima. The Reaper was standing there. Why do beautiful things remind us of death more than life? Strangely, I thought he was beautiful. I was so captivated by him, I didn't even notice what lay beneath me. It wasn't flowers, but it was an exorbitant amount of death. Kaneki here mixes up death and beauty, which was foreshadowing of both how this fight would go and what Kaneki's intentions were throughout this fight, and potentially throughout all of the original Tokyo Ghoul. As Kaneki has many questionable decisions when it comes to preserving his own life, we find out that in Tokyo Ghoul Re, 
that Kaneki had entered this fight with the sole purpose of going out in a blaze of glory as a self-sacrificial hero. Nothing more, nothing less. Kaneki now asks, was Arima able to do this by himself? He then notices that he has arrived at Route V14, the meeting place for him, Koma, and Irimi, once Kaneki was able to save Yoshimura and escape. He instantly accepts that Arima has slaughtered them, and then says, I tried riling myself up with hatred, but more than sorrow, more than anger, the emotion rushing through me was despair, because it would be me who would be next. Kaneki understands the situation, and panic begins to set in. He's unable to collect his thoughts and make a decision. He knows he can't run and he must fight here. Arima stands completely still, and Kaneki firms himself. As he remembers what Hide said to him, he will give it all and strike first. But to no avail. Arima is able to impale Kaneki with ease before he can see anything, and as Kaneki attempts to gain distance, he begins to affirm to himself that he can still fight, but is impaled through the head before he can even finish thinking this sentence. Agony now sets in. Kaneki begins to scream relentlessly as he repeatedly says to himself that his face is caving in. His sight is completely skewed, and as the garnet of death becomes nothing but black and white, madness slowly begins to settle in. Kaneki begins to ask what is going to happen to him. He then activates his Kagune and pulls out the blade from his brain and can barely say Arima's name before attacking him. He unleashes a massive attack while reciting a poem which Arima is able to dodge with ease. As Kaneki continues to lose it, he begins to ask things such as why is nobody here? And mom, can I ride the swing? He also calls out for both of his parents, meanwhile telling Arima to read it and to give it back, with it most likely being a book, the same book that Kaneki was reciting in his previous attack. Kaneki continues to talk, telling Hide that it's over and his brain is melting then telling himself that he needs to calm down using something, anything, and what comes to mind is another poem. As Kaneki recites his poem, Arma then says that it's beautiful, to which Kaneki responds by saying, it's by Hakushu. Arma then picks up on the fact that he's fighting Kaneki, and says that it's raining. You can't tell the weather outside when you're underground, and you also lose your sense of time. But, you can tell it's raining outside by the sound of the water. It'll stop raining soon. This is V14. I cannot allow Gua to pass through here. You will go no farther. Arima activates another Quin K, Narukami, and begins to send multiple bolts of lightning throughout his garden of corpses. As Kaneki begins to desperately evade all of Arima's attacks, he says to himself that Arima is like a monster, yet he is only human. All I need to do is strike him once and I will win. This pushes Kaneki to go for one final strike, which is easily blocked by Arima's first weapon. This attack does break the weapon upon impact, which garners Arima's praise. As Arima impales Kaneki one last time, he ends the battle. Kaneki regains consciousness on a slide at the neighborhood park he used to play at as a child. He sees another child off in the distance and turns away, asking where he's at in the first place. He walks through the streets of Tokyo, eventually coming back to his home. He finds his mother still working and she says welcome home, and Kaneki then gets on his knees and tells her that she doesn't need to work anymore, begging her to please stop. He asks her to look at him and then he realizes that like himself, his mother wanted to have everyone around her, and thus, she continued to push herself too far, causing herself to pass away. Kaneki begins to reminisce on conversations with everybody that he's loved and cherished, remembering that each and every one of them begged him to value his life and make the decisions that would preserve it. As Kaneki refused to save himself before saving everybody around him, he pushed himself way too far. He did all of this while also being reluctant to place the weight of his choices on the balance, which reflects his inability to critically think during the later half of Tokyo Ghoul. As Kaneki made a lot of his decisions off of anger combined with his other emotions and thus stripped himself of the ability to logically consider the consequences of his actions in the long run. Pretending to be concerned for others when I was only thinking about myself. Kaneki says this admits that he really did not think about what everybody wanted in the end. Kaneki went into this raid going against every single one of his friends wishes one way or another because he desperately wanted to keep everybody safe no matter what. 
he didn't enter the raid with the intention of saving his friends for anybody but himself. This results in him losing his life, essentially accomplishing nothing but killing off the only humans who took the time to understand him. If you think that Kaneki would consider Amon as a friend, then you could even say that Kaneki caused more harm than good with his presence. As Kaneki goes through his thoughts and memories, he realizes that the reason his mother worked so hard for the sake of his aunt was because she was scared of losing someone again, like she once lost her husband. He says that his mother wasn't a kind person, but just a coward, and so was he. He admits to himself once more that he only wanted to protect himself all along, and that he went about this whole thing completely wrong. Kaneki chose to protect himself by protecting others rather than protecting others by protecting himself. Had Kaneki chosen to prioritize himself and his safety in order to protect those around him, he would have saved many of his friends and himself from either death or excessive pain multiple times. For example, Kaneki could have killed Jason the moment they met if he was worried about his own safety. This would have prevented the death of some of his friends and his own trauma. But instead, he allows himself to be taken in and tortured for the sake of protecting those around him. Kaneki allows himself to be hurt, sacrificed, and puts himself into many high-risk situations for the sake of protecting others, which usually results at best a bittersweet victory. I believe that protecting yourself before others is a lesson that Arma wanted to teach Kaneki by force in their final battle. As Kaneki decided to protect Anteku by sacrificing himself, he ends up getting eradicated by Arma. But the moment that Kaneki chose to protect himself and fight to live on for his own sake, he was able to hold off Arima and convince him that he was a worthy successor, and thus was able to both survive and protect everybody as well. Kaneki in a way teaches the reader that their lives have more impact than they may believe, and that the best version for you is the version that lives for yourself and not others. This isn't to say be as selfish as possible, but it's more so saying that you can't give others the best help you possibly can if you aren't at your peak. So focus on keeping yourself in top shape before focusing on the lives of others. Kaneki stumbles upon himself at the playground, and he says, waiting for mom to come home, reading dad's books by myself, playing alone in the sandbox. It was this boy. This was the boy I didn't want feeling lonely. Toka was right. I was only thinking about myself. I want to say that I believe Kaneki affirms what Toka said after seeing his childhood self, because at the end of his own life, what he sees is himself, and himself alone. He sees all of his friends very briefly, and even his mother for a brief moment of time, but he sees his childhood self last, and for an extended amount of time compared to everybody else. Kaneki and his child self speak to each other for a little bit, and eventually decide that it's time to head home because it's getting dark. As they both leave, Kaneki says, I led myself by the hand, weaving through the memories dripping out with my brain. We just kept walking, with no destination or purpose, with ominous clouds in the sky, I already knew what was going to happen to me the next time I came to. Kaneki asks if his child self likes his mother, and child Kaneki says yeah, I wonder when I will grow up if I can help people like mom does, and Kaneki looks at his child self horrified. As his look can mean many things, he begins to apologize excessively, and gets onto his knees saying it's my fault, I'm why you what have I done? It's my fault. And as Kaneki apologizes to his child self even more, the child then says we're horrible, aren't we? But it's okay. You saved me so many times. I was weak so you fought in my place. I'm not angry. Thank you for everything. Adult Kaneki in this moment realizes that he's messed up a lot, but he also understands that he's done the best that he could with all he knew and understood this before passing on. Kaneki forgives himself for one last time, his mind turns to ash, and memories of that fateful day flash across his mind. He'd seen it, and beyond Rize's gaze that night was...